Hi, I'm Jim Barnett. My mom used to say I was born with my motor running. I love to be on the go. I'm on a mission to check out as many interesting places and as many interesting people as I can. <laughs> and along the way, I want to see who's got the best food. Hey, you're welcome to ride along, but I gotta go. You know, we usually try to visit an area when there's something big going on, some big festival or whatever. Today, we're headed to a spot because there's nothing big going on. The first time I came here, I vowed never to come back, but it was really my fault. I came to Panama City and Panama City Beach during spring break. Oh, <laughs> for somebody like me, who likes to explore the history and the natural beauty of an area, that was a big mistake. But I got to thinking, there's got to be a lot more to Panama City and Panama City Beach than just spring break. Let's go find out. There's really a lot to like about this area. It sits along the northwestern coast of Florida, right on the Gulf of Mexico, and lays claim to about 27 miles of beautiful white sand beaches. The sand, water, and beautiful weather are just a few of the reasons why people flock here, especially kids during spring break, that two-month rite of passage in March and April that draws just a few hundred thousand kids from all over North America. It's no wonder this area is referred to as the spring break capital of the world. And trust me, I'm not alone when it comes to misconceptions about Panama City. Hey, where are you headed? Oh, hey, going on a va uh, family vacation. Oh, really? Anywhere in particular? No, we're just going to head down south, get out of this cold. Ever thought about uh, Panama City Beach? Oh, no, no, no. It's too crazy for me. It's just nothing but a bunch of parties down there. <laughs> uh, this, this is a family vacation. What do you think about a vacation in Panama City Beach? Panama City Beach? Why would I go there? That's like for young kids getting drunk. I got a glimpse of that the first time I was here. But this time, totally different. I didn't hear about one student falling off a balcony. This time, there weren't any reports of drunken parties, and the streets were almost quiet. It's like a totally different atmosphere. So I thought, before I checked out anything else, I'd talk to some local folks about spring break. Oh, before this first interview, I want you to enjoy just a few seconds of what Panama City Beach is normally like an average of 320 days of sunshine and 74 toasty degrees. Because that's not what it was on the day we scheduled this interview with John Starling. This is freezing cold for me. <laughs> <laughs> I was checking out some early aerial photos and discovered that John's family started one of the first businesses on Panama City Beach, the campground where we had parked the motorhome. I thought I'd get his take on spring break. What does, what does spring break and that whole party atmosphere mean to Panama City Beach? Oh, that's easy. First off, cash. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's 35% it's of my yearly wow. business. And John's not alone when it comes to how business owners feel about spring break. Fred Jacobs down at the Red Rose Pub backed him up. What is it, uh, if you had to put it on a percentage basis, uh, what does spring break mean? Like, is that 50% of your business for the year, you think, or 30, or? Uh, I'll say about 35, 40%. Bill York, who runs a popular spot called Foghorns, agreed with that percentage and even gave us some banking advice. Wow, you better bank your money during the good times. You do, in this, <laughs> you do, you do in Panama City because the good times don't last that long anymore. John from the campground used this word. Seasonality, seasonality. He doesn't know it, but it's that word that brought me back to Panama City to give it a second chance. I think for most people who've outgrown their high school and college years, seasonality is the reason you have to look beyond spring break when you think about this area. Scratch beneath the surface and you'll find out it's a beautiful, historically rich part of Florida. Okay, before the phones start ringing, we've got to clear something up right here. In one sentence, you'll hear me talking about Panama City, and in the next breath, you'll hear me say Panama City Beach. Legally, they're two completely different governmental bodies, but when you're a visitor, it all sort of blends into one destination. The two towns are located on opposite sides of St. Andrews Bay. 
Other than the Gulf of Mexico, the bay dominates everything around here, and it should. It's huge. It covers 758 square miles and pretty much surrounds Panama City. Because of all the maritime traffic here for hundreds of years, some of it uh, not so successful, the bay is known as the wreck capital of the world and draws thousands of divers looking for treasure. Legend has it that pirates trolled these waters waiting for ships headed for Spain and Mexico. The only pirates you'll see here today are more for advertising purposes. If you go to the oldest part of town, to what's referred to as the St. Andrews District, you'll see where local history got its start. Oh, by the way, don't get caught up in the Battle of the S. The neighborhood sign says St. Andrews, but the school sign says Andrew. The Baptist Church doesn't use the S, but the Presbyterian Church does. The St. Andrews Marina is where you'll find the St. Andrew Bay Ferry. The historical plaque right outside the school is where they admit they're just not too sure about the S. Oaks by the Bay Park is the most historical piece of ground in this most historical part of Panama City. At Buena Vista Point, inside the park, they've unearthed evidence to show that Native Americans were here 13,000 years ago. St. Andrews is also the spot where Spanish expeditions came in the 1500s, and it's where the first Europeans settled. The seafood from the bay and the Gulf of Mexico is what drew the earliest settlers to this area. St. Andrews and all of the Panama City area is still a major fishing port for blue marlin, red snapper, mackerel, and trout. Later settlers to the St. Andrews area came for the timber and the salt. We don't think too much about salt now, but there was a time before refrigeration when salt was the only way to preserve meat. That meant it was big business. The St. Andrews Bay Salt Works was one of the largest salt producers in the South in the 1800s, selling salt for up to $50 a bushel. The salt they produced was so important that during the Civil War, Union troops destroyed the salt works in an effort to weaken the Southern forces. Now here's a piece of history that some locals probably aren't too proud of, but it all started right here in what they call the Cincinnati Hill neighborhood. Way back when St. Andrews was still a town of its own, this was the site of the first Florida mail order land scheme. It was in 1885 when the St. Andrews Land, Railroad and Mining Company, based in Cincinnati by the way, started advertising all over the United States that you could buy a 25 by 120 foot lot for only a dollar and a quarter in what they called lovely St. Andrews by the Bay. Well, in just 100 days, 6,000 people bought land and started moving into the area. What they found when they got here was sandy soil, nothing like they were used to, or sometimes something worse, no commerce to speak of, and only the start of a transportation system. Most of the hoodwinked land buyers found themselves camping on the beach and fishing just to stay alive. Well, I guess if you wanted to see the true value of that dollar and a quarter lot you bought in 1885, you'd have to wait about 125 years and see what that lot's selling for today. Well, it goes without saying that nothing has stopped people from moving to the sunny and warm state of Florida. There's been a handful of significant events that have helped to turn this area into what we see today. Probably the biggest was when a company wanted to use the thousands of acres of trees around here to make paper. Prior to the 1930s, this area was made up of three small towns, St. Andrews, Millville, and Harrison. Harrison, though, got a name change during the building of the Panama Canal. Developers thought because the town was on a straight line between the new canal and Chicago, and at least, well, according to them, the closest U.S. port to the new canal, they might be able to cash in on all the hoopla around this new navigational shortcut. So they changed the name from Harrison to Panama, but it was still an area made up of three small towns. I'm going to let Jack Mashburn explain the next part. He literally wrote the book on Panama City history. 
And when the International Paper Company decided to build a mill in the South, they had a meeting with the powers that be in the city here and others and said, we can't do it, we can't present it to our board unless you have 10,000 people in your city. So, needless to say, with some finagling, the three small towns were combined and took on the name of just one town, Panama City. Another boost was when the Wainwright shipyard started making Liberty ships here. For those who don't know about Liberty ships, you have to think back to World War II, when German submarines were sinking Allied ships so fast, there was a chance we could lose the war. President Roosevelt basically said, we have to build ships faster than they can sink them. Wainwright was one of 18 shipyards around the nation that started cranking out cookie cutter ships as fast as humanly possible. We built one every week. I mean, we launched one. We had it going. We had a several waves where they would uh, build these ships and they'd have one being built while another one being fine-tuned for launching. They'd launch that one, they'd have another one ready. One a week, just like laying eggs with a chicken. We were building faster than they could sink them, and that's what the, uh, Roosevelt said we could do, uh -huh. and he was right. When you're talking about World War II, the military, and how they affected the Panama City area, you can't ignore one of the most strategic military bases in the nation that's based right here and gave this area another one of its big growth spurts. It was created as a gunnery range back in 1941 as the Flexible Gunnery School No. 9. But when the Air Force branch was established in 1947, it took on the name Tyndall Air Force Base. It's had a variety of uses over the years since the big war. Today it's home to the 325th Fighter Wing and the F-22 Raptor. Together, they provide airspace surveillance and control for the continental United States. The base has brought millions of dollars to the region and thousands of people. But the person it's known for the most is a young gunnery student who was stationed here back in 1943. His dog tag probably had him listed as William, but for millions of movie fans around the world, he was Clark, Clark Gable. One of the highlights of teenage life in Panama City in 1943 was trying to find the movie star around town. But usually he escaped. He, he, he was pretty good at that. Speaking of escaping things, when you need an attorney, you need an attorney. In the United States, there's a fundamental principle that if you can't afford an attorney, the court will provide you with one. You're not going to be fed to the lions without someone fighting for you. That principle of law got started right here in Panama City. The famous Gideon versus Wainwright case that every attorney learns about in law school took place right here at the Bay County Courthouse. He was accused of robbing a Bay Harbor two room apartment uh, complex there. Without an attorney, Gideon was charged with the robbery even though everybody knew the witnesses couldn't have identified him or anyone else from a hundred yards away in the dark. Gideon himself personally wrote the appeal on uh, brown paper from his cell in, uh, in uh, state prison in, in Florida, and they accepted his handwritten appeal and awarded him a new trial. That new trial came with a court-appointed attorney to help Gideon with his case. And he changed history, because from now on, they have to appoint you an attorney if you can't afford one. It is bedrock in our law. and If you can't afford defense. You are entitled to one and the court shall appoint you one.